Um, we can adjust it. Loud and clear, Steve, how me? Mr. Cabana, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, I can hear you well. How's everything going? What's, it, what's the weather like down there? Well, the fog just burned off, and you should be able to see a really awesome rocket over my shoulder. Okay. Well, I can't. I, I understand <laughs> you guys are getting some nasty thunderstorms here in Huntsville. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's the weather's doing its spring thing right now, but, uh, you know, we're dealing. Nothing, nothing severe right now, which is good. Oh, yeah, there we go. That is beautiful. All right. You got me? Yes, sir. We've got you. Awesome. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, is it okay if I call you Bob? You may. Okay, well, Bob, let's, well, let me just go ahead and get started. All right, you mentioned that beautiful rocket over your shoulder. Can you kind of talk about the feelings that you have, and I suppose you could say everybody at NASA has, finally getting to this crucial step, uh, which happened shortly before a launch? How, what's it like to have the rocket on the pad? Oh, ab absolutely amazing. And uh, as many of your viewers in Huntsville know, uh, Huntsville's play played a huge role in that uh, core stage for the Space Launch System uh, in, in getting us out there. You know, it's just been seeing everything come together. You know, over the past few years, the crawler transporter modifications, the mobile launcher getting built, having the hardware arrive, getting it stacked and tested in the VAB. But there is nothing like seeing a rocket roll out of that vehicle assembly building on the way to the pad. And this rocket was truly built for that building. Uh, they had all the doors open all the way to the top in order for it to, uh, to roll out. More powerful at liftoff than a, a Saturn V from the Apollo era. But, you know, getting it out on the pad for this test, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll fuel it. We'll do everything that we would for a launch, count down to T0, but not light the engines. We're gonna learn a lot. We'll roll back into the vehicle assembly building make any corrections that we need to, and then it will roll out for launch on that pad, and I can't wait to see that happen. That's gonna be probably in, uh, in early June when we launch Artemis One with the Orion capsule and the Space Launch System on its test flight without a crew to the moon. I, I just can't wait. It's really an exciting time for our nation's space program. Okay, now my assumption is you expect or at least hope that everything's going to go great for the uh, wet rehearsal test, but is there any part of this test is the part, if we get past this, Steve, we're going to be in good shape. Is there any part that concerns you more than another? No, I, I think, you know, we have prepared well for this. Uh, it's an amazing team. They've worked really hard. But I, I'm sure there will be things that, that we discover, as we have with other testing that we've done. When we did the Green Run test down in Mississippi, we found some things that needed correction prior to uh, shipping the rocket here to KSC for integration for uh, test and launch here. So I, it isn't any one thing. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But I'm hopeful, you know, everything could go perfect. Uh, you know. Okay, I wanted to ask you a question, and I think you're going to like talking about this. Can you very briefly describe to people who don't build rockets why it is so hard to build a rocket like SLS and get to the point of testing it like this? Why, does it, why is it so hard, and why does it take so long? Well, uh, first off, it's a really big rocket and it's very complex. Um, the Space Launch System utilizes uh, Heritage hardware. The solid rocket motor casings, they're the same steel casings that we utilize during the shuttle program. The engines that power the uh, Space Launch System, those are the same engines that we used on the space shuttle. In fact, we had 16 of those engines left over from the shuttle program that were in storage at Stennis, Mississippi. And uh, we're using four of them for a mission on SLS. So we got four flights all ready to go. Uh, new engine controllers beefed up. There was a lot of testing and design. This is different from the shuttle. If you'll notice, uh, it's probably about twice as tall as the shuttle. So that changes a lot of things. Uh, science, you know, I mean, the engineering has changed from Apollo to shuttle till now. So there have been changes made. Uh, for one thing, the amount of data that we're collecting is just phenomenal as we uh, learn about this rocket. You give uh, engineers more capability and they're going to use it. So with better computers, we get more data and we understand things better. So it, it's a very complex system and we want to make sure that it's absolutely right before we launch crew. So it takes time. And we've, we've had a number of delays, uh, obviously, uh, the COVID uh, you know, pandemic 
uh, slowed us down quite a bit, as a matter of fact. But if I look back on what we accomplished in the midst of a global pandemic, what an amazing team that we have to be able to get through everything and, uh, and get to where we are today. Okay, I want to ask you a question about the symbolism of launching from uh, Pad 39B. The Apollo launched there, shuttles launched there. You yourself have launched <laughs> in a mission from Pad 39B. Can you talk about the symbolism of, of America continuing all the great things we've done uh, through NASA on Pad 39B? Well, this launch complex, you know, the vision that the Apollo engineers and scientists had when they built this complex, uh, you know, they built pads A and B. They actually had plans for pad C and D further up the coast. So I think it's that heritage of having gone to the moon. Uh, obviously, you know, we launched uh, missions to the moon from pad B, the shuttle launch from pad B, uh, Skylab. Uh, and Apollo Soyuz test project launched from pad B. So yes, a very historic pad, and we're keeping that going. I think history plays a great role in what we do. I think the cool thing about this though is, we're going back to the moon in a sustainable way with Artemis. As Apollo inspired a generation of scientists and engineers, it's gonna be even more so with this Artemis generation today. And, and we're not going to the moon for a two or three day camping trip like we did during Apollo. We're going to stay. We're going to learn. We, uh, we're going to utilize resources on the moon. We're going to have the habitats, pressurized rovers. We're going to do on the moon what we need to do in preparation for going to Mars, for establishing that presence in our solar system beyond our home planet. So I think that's really exciting. We, are, we learn to live and operate for extended periods of time off our home planet on the International Space Station. Now we're taking that even further as we go to the moon and beyond. Just a, an amazing time. Okay, you, you sort of answered my next question, so I thought of another one. You're an astronaut, you've been. Would you jump in Orion for Artemis One if you could? I, I'm trying to figure out how I can stow away on this test flight. I, <laughs> absolutely. I would, I, I'd go back in a heartbeat. You know, John Glenn was 77 years old when he flew uh, that second mission of his after his historic flight 60 years ago last February. And uh, I'm still holding out hope. I'm not, I'm not 77 yet, so maybe I got a chance. I still passed my flight physical, so I'm ready. If they, if they call me up, I'm, I'm on my way. All right, uh, Bob Cabana, thank you very much for talking to us this morning, and uh, we're certainly all excited here about uh, this next test. My friends in Huntsville, you guys are an amazing team, and that's what this is all about. Space is a team effort. You got that. I think he cut me off. Oh, well. All right. 11.30.